basically reporting what uh, we have been doing so far and, uh, and uh, user stories that uh, we have uh, identified. On this second session, we will uh, talk uh, on the implications for, for repository platforms and uh, the, what we need to, to do to, to achieve this vision of the next generation repository. So we will have just two presentations and then again uh, 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 some space for, for discussion and debate. So the first one will be uh, Paul. Uh, Thank you, Elon. So I've been asked to talk about uh, or answer the question, what does the next generation repository look like? And my brief is that I'm not allowed to talk about technology or implementation. So I think the next generation repository system looks like this. Can, I, can, I, can you put your hand up if you recognize these books? Yeah, you see, this isn't going to work so well. I, I thought these were more widely known than that. Anyway, I'm committed to it. Um, before we come on to the next generation repositories, I just want to make a couple of points about the repositories that we, we have now, the current um, generation. Um, for no good reason at all, I've put a photograph of Portsmouth Football Club winning uh, League 4 in the UK uh, last week. Um, but it was a picture of people cheering. So I think there are three good things we can say about our current repositories. So firstly, these are proven technology. You know, this. Um, these repository systems have been in near continuous um, deployment for over a decade in our institutions. Um, it's easy to forget that, it's easy just to, to take that for granted, but you know, this is technology which is proven and ubiquitous. And all of the things which go with the technology, the management of it, the uh, resourcing of those systems, it's all very well established, that's, that's important. Secondly, we've got strong community support for this these systems and this infrastructure. I mean, just the fact that we're all here today in this room is, is evidence of that. And thirdly, and I think possibly most importantly, the control of the systems and most importantly the control of the resources in those systems is distributed. It's not owned by one uh, major publisher, for example. It's distributed among all of our institutions. And I think that's a key aspect to uh, a lot of what we uh, are talking about in these meetings, we need to keep that in mind. It's a strategy for avoiding monopolies, which is important. But anyway, that was uh, the current generation repositories. We have a goal which is more ambitious than that, and, and that is the, the goal um, that, that appears in the, um, the paper that we're putting together in the core. So the position with repositories is the foundation for a distributed, globally networked infrastructure for scholarly communication. That's a pretty ambitious goal. I think it's a good ambition to have. So I think the next generation repository is those things. I'm going to talk about each one of them in, in some detail. So it's, it's connected. It's part of the network. It's talkative. It's not just sitting there quietly allowing people to find things. It's actually expressing itself as a system on the, on the network. It's responsive. It doesn't just serve up resources on request, it does more than that. It, it satisfies requirements from other systems and people. And it's busy, it's not just sitting there, it's hard work. So this is where the cartoons come in, these are the Mr. Men. So there isn't a cartoon for um, highly networked. Um, so I've got Mr. Tickle, his arms go everywhere, he's kind of very networked. So the next generation repository is connected, and it's not just connected in a general sense, it's connected at every level. This is kind of an important um, thing to grasp, I think. Um, we tend to think of systems being connected to other systems, and there's some truth in that, but also in a web context, the resources within the system are connected to resources in other systems. It's about connections at every level, not just the, the overall systems, but the resources within them, even the metadata records. You know, we have metadata records which refer to other metadata records. And those connections are both outgoing and incoming. Um, We've talked earlier a little bit about um, ORCIDs, but we, we have other global identifier 
satellite systems, or it is an important one, but there are others. And those are essentially incoming connections. The moment that we include an ORCID or a DOI or one of the other identifiers in a metadata record in our repository, we're facilitating an incoming connection on the network to that metadata record. And then if we have good connections between our metadata records and our resources, not always the case, sadly, but if we do, then we're facilitating a connection directly to that resource. And that allows us to start to conceive of uh, overlay services. We've heard about things like uh, peer review services, annotation services. These start to become possible because these connections are facilitated. So uh, I have kind of said this, but I just really want to emphasize this. Connected means that all of these things are nodes in a network. The repository itself is a node. Actually, in the end, it could become the, le the least interesting node. The individual um, content items, which are typically things which can be web resources, those are the in the network. The metadata records, the users. This is really important, the users are nodes in the record. This is why we've been hearing about the desirability of having users represented in our repository infrastructure, having identified, uh, being identified so that we can start to um, gather patterns of behaviour and so on. This is how social networks work. You know, those users, people in social networks, they are nodes in the network. And the network is the web, let's not forget that. I mean, actually, uh, in some cases, our repository systems are not as web-friendly as they could be. And the web is, is really the only game in town for this kind of thing. So the next generation repository is talkative. Now our, our contemporary repositories are what I would call quite reticent. You know, they're sitting there not really um, advertising what they have, they're not saying very much, they're waiting for a request. It's quite a passive um, approach. Um, it does facilitate people being able to search and browse, so you know, there's good um, uh, functionality there. Um, we have software agents which are harvesting and aggregating. We've heard about a few of those today. Um, I make the point that aggregation is, is sometimes exaggerated in its importance. It's a, it's a tactic, really. It's a means of allowing you to do things with content. The aggregation itself is not the, the goal. You know, it's, it's just a, a, a way of getting around a, a number of problems like network latency and so on. So the next generation repository is talking to the world. It's publishing events. We've talked about heard from power about notification systems. This is going to be really important, I think. This is a crucial um, concept in the next generation repository. And then it's, in so doing, it's inviting other systems to respond. It's saying, hey, look, I've just done this with this resource. You may be interested in that. I, I know from things that you've published elsewhere that you probably are interested in this. And reaching out to human users in the same way. You know, from what I know of your behaviour and the networks that you're part of and the other systems you interact with, you probably want to know about this. So the next generation repository is responsive. So as well as being talkative, it's both talkative but it's a good listener, you know, at the same time. And I think really what, I, what I'm trying to convey there is, is the, the idea that it is able to respond in an intelligent way to a growing set of demands on it from all of the sorts of overlay services which we've talked about, <coughs> the kinds of new functionality that people want, um, as repositories are plugged into more and more workflows, uh, more sophisticated workflows from researchers, the demands of our repositories are going to be increasingly sophisticated. It won't be just give me this piece of content or give me this metadata record. It'll be give me this piece of content and allow me to do this thing with it and, and give it back to you in an improved state, perhaps. You know, annotated or commented in some way. And not just allowing text mining, I mean, it's really depressing how so much of what we've um, had to deal with around text mining in the last several years has just been about getting permission to do it. <laughs> but actually, we, we really want to be talking about properly supporting it as a first order activity that I can see Peter nodding over there. 
violent agreement. And then, and then benefit, you know, the repositories ought to be able to benefit from this. If you allow your content to be text mined properly, then there is information which is derived from that, which you can then use to improve the metadata around your, your resources. Yeah, this ought to be just a simple win-win situation that the publishers ought to realise this too. So I couldn't find one Mr. Man to uh, express that, so these two guys are working as a sort of team. And finally, I think the next generation repository is, is busy, it's, it's working all the time, you know. We, we put quite a lot of um, investment of time and effort into these systems, we really ought to be you know, squeezing as much kind of value out of them as we possibly can. So we know that they're preserving content, which is good. Um, there's probably a lot more we could be doing around preservation, actually. And, you know, there, there are all kinds of interesting technologies which have, <coughs> excuse me, developed around the um, the repository ecosystem, but it's sort of fairly unevenly applied. Um, we could be actively improving the metadata that we hold all the time, actually. You know, there are lots of systems where you can be going out and periodically checking and finding more information about the resources that you hold and just improving the metadata. These kinds of uh, information flows can be shared and exchanged also. And then um, we've already talked about supporting the sort of overlay systems, which in some ways is the real goal of this, is allowing repositories to support the kind of things which people actually want to do, like peer review, annotation, collections management, all kinds of things. <coughs> Sorry, I'm really dehydrated, I think. You've got some water. I've got some, actually. Um, and then exchanging this information. Now, there are all kinds of uh, ways in which we might find um, we can start to really help each other by exchanging much richer information between our repository systems. Well, something which tends to happen at the moment. This is where the uh, broker system starts to really become important because you need to have a way of doing that efficiently rather than every repository sending every other repository everything it knows. So you need some way of uh, being able to register interest and uh, notification, and that's the, the broker idea. I think collections management is something which we've not really looked at very much in, in institutional repositories. I mean, there, there are examples of repositories which are focused around collections, but um, the sort of collections management that libraries are starting to really pay attention to now um, because of scarcity of resource, I think there's actually quite a lot to learn from that in terms of the application of uh, technology to uh, repository systems. But whatever happens, the important thing, the underlying thing, is it's got to support the workflows of our users, whoever they are. It's got to give them some sort of value. Um, and then, and, yeah, the repository's role in that is, is still fundamentally about providing and accepting uh, data, content and resources, um, and adding value in both of those, those flows. So what will it look like? Well, I think the thing I would predict is that our repositories will increasingly not look like a standalone software system. And in fact, that could mean that they become a bit harder to, to even identify. Once something becomes much more plugged into the network and, and the boundaries become a little less clear, it's, it's harder to actually see the repository, um, even as its value increases. So that's really a characteristic of infrastructure, that's what happens with infrastructure, it sort of disappears into the background a little. Now I'm not suggesting our repositories disappear because you know, we have a lot of vested interest in uh, making sure that they have a high profile at one level. So we have to be kind of crafty about this, you know, we have to make sure that value is recognised even as the uh, repository itself ceases to become necessarily the, you know, the destination for all Activity. And this is the uh, dilemma for infrastructure generally, this is what always happens. Um, the huge amounts of public spending go into infrastructure which no one can see, so it's not particularly uh, um, easy to, um, to justify to people who have a vote, for example. 
I think the, some of the other characteristics we're going to see is that repositories will have to be more fluid, um, that those boundaries become uh, more permeable. Um, as users become first order nodes on the network, then user mediation in all of these transactions is going to become increasingly important. And that's a trick we just haven't, um, we haven't done yet, you know, it's, uh, I know it's a sort of cliche to talk about Facebook and these things, but in these terms, Facebook is so far ahead of what we're doing with repositories, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit embarrassing. <coughs> Providing direct access to content and data, now it's, this is another one of those things which is a little depressing, we are a long way away from providing easy direct access to the content that we hold in our repositories in a lot of cases. And that's just you know, something we really need to sort out really quickly. Um, that, that shouldn't be on a slide about the next generation repositories, that should be on a slide about the previous generation really. This is a, this is a problem that we really need to solve. It's surprisingly difficult. <coughs> for a piece of software to reliably get a piece of content in a, one of our repositories at the moment, as a general rule. Surprisingly difficult. Has to negotiate all kinds of uh, obstacles, including you know, the sort of splash pages and logins and all kinds of things. We've got to solve that. If we don't solve that, then nothing else we've talked about is really going to work. And I think the repository, as I say, it, it needs to become part of the infrastructure, and that infrastructure needs to be global. It's really, it's just pointless talking about um, regional infrastructure in, in these contexts. It just doesn't make any sense. Research isn't regional. Lots of the other things that we use repositories to support are not really regional. I appreciate that spending on infrastructure can be regional, so that's another small dilemma that we have to solve, but we have to do it nonetheless. So I think that the less clear the boundaries of the repository, the more useful it's likely to turn out to be. And that's me, thank you.